Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jacinta Thompson, and I'm the Executive Director of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land we meet on today is Ghana land, and we wish to express our respect for the Ghana people, their elders and ancestors, and acknowledge the cultural and spiritual relationship that they have with their land. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia to hear from our dynamic guest who has made the gruelling journey from New York to speak to us tonight. And a warm welcome to Nusrat Durrani. Thank you, Nusrat. I just wanted to share um, a very short background story as to why Nusrat is here. In January this year, I had the most extraordinary and uh, almost death-defying journey working at the Jaipur Literature Festival in India. And across an extremely crowded, and I mean crowded, room, I came across Nusrat. So after a wonderfully divine and uh, conversation and hearing about his work, I felt that uh, Nusrat would make for a brilliant inclusion into the Hawke Centre program. I also suggested to the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival director that she may want to think about presenting Nusrat in their festival this year. And of course, Janet came back to me immediately with a resounding yes which is very exciting. So, for the first time, the Hawke Centre is going to be very proud to be presenting at the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival in Bali in October, in a couple of weeks, where Nusrat will deliver two sessions in the main program and one session at Ruma Sanua. So, this session tonight is being recorded, videoed, and will be available on the Hawke Centre website next week. So as we are recording, can I please ask that you switch your phones to silent, but please feel free to share, um, to join the Twitter conversation using the link behind me. And Nusrat will be taking questions after his presentation. So for further information about Nusrat, Nusrat Durrani is a pioneering media executive, producer, an award-winning creative with a portfolio of transformative multi-platform content and branded entertainment for both commer commercial and social impact. Nusrat infuses American culture with global influences across film, music, and fashion by creating platforms for unheard voices and telling untold stories from around the world. He was honored by President Obama for his work spotlighting young Native American artists and has collaborated with the White House on films about indigenous youth. Most recently, Nusrat founded and served as general manager and senior vice president at MTV World, Viacom Media Network's visionary global content incubator and innovation en engine, and created and executive produced the acclaimed Rebel Music documentary series about young change agents fighting the status quo in turbulent countries. Nusrat's current passion projects, including developing a line, I love this, a line of furniture inspired by David Bowie, launching a sustainable fashion brand, and developing two books on travel photography. So a warm welcome to Nusrat Durrani. Thank you. Hello, Australia. How's it going? We can do a little better than that. How's it going? Rock and roll. I am so excited to be here, truly. This is my first trip to your country. And, um, you know, I couldn't be here for a better reason. I am so grateful to Jacinta Thompson and the Hawk Center for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to actually come and meet all of you. Um, so far, my my trip here has been enchanting. The country is beautiful, the people are warm and lovely, and you know, the weather is amazing. Um, and we're having a little bit of a moment in America. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, also, thanks to all of you for showing up, because it's Tuesday evening, it's a working day, you could be doing a lot more exciting things. 
And you're here to listen to me, and I'm very humble and honored. So thank you so much. Um, you know, usually my talks are delivered in somewhat different circumstances, but Jacinta is actually a, a very um, interesting and, uh, I think, enlightened curator because she's enabling conversations globally between thought leaders. And it's interesting that she enabled this conversation to occur. And even in my short stay here in Australia, I found that there's so much connectivity that we could be actually creating between Australia and America and India and France and all, all sorts of countries. We don't know Australia as much as we should. There's a lot of beautiful things happening here, and I'm so happy that this kind of connection can, can make those things happen. So thank you. Um, you know, I wish I were here to talk about love in a time of love. But the fact is that we live in troubled times. And hate dominates the world, not love. And so I have to deliver this particular talk instead of another talk that I should have written, which is much more poetic and sexy and beautiful. Uh, but I think we, it is important that we talk about all of the things that are happening today in the world. I was born in India, where most of my ideas around secularism and syncretity and love were shaped. India is a country with glorious manifestations of love, mythic and modern. Anyone been to India? Amazing. I think all of you should visit, because India is actually 10,000 countries. And, you know, it's interesting to find the depth and dimensionality of it. But it is a country where we were taught to, taught to love gods and goddesses and our mothers and sisters and where romantic and erotic love are enshrined in temples and texts that are thousands of years old. But there's a tidal wave of rancor sweeping that country and many other parts of the world. And as we speak, a child dies every five minutes in Yemen because of the Saudi Arabia embargo on aid. Thousands of Rohingya Muslims have been killed by the military in Myanmar in systematic ethnic cleansing, which has yet to be condemned by Nobel Peace Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi. It's a shame. And in my country, the United States of America, a madman with a gun killed 50 innocent people this month. And we have a president whose operating principles seem to be based on racism and xenophobia. And it's embarrassing as an American to see this happening. The sad poetry of America today is about building walls, you know, keeping Muslims out of the country, preventing the transgender from joining the army, denying the horrendous damage we're doing to the environment, and the failure to keep guns out of the hands of trigger-happy psychopaths. That's America today. And in these hateful times, even the dispossessed, struck by tragedy, have not been spared our vitriol. The Syrian refugee crisis, I'm sure that all of you in this room know what that is. This, I think, is the, one of the biggest humanitarian tragedies in history. These innocent human beings who are fleeing dictators and fanatics in a war in which they have lost their homes seen their parents blown to bits and children crushed under tanks are most deserving of our compassion and empathy. Instead, many countries have treated them shamefully. They've drowned, been refused entry, shot, raped, interned, mislabeled terrorists, and exploited by politicians. So the truth is we do live in hateful times. But the fact is, that an act of love, filmed right here in your very beautiful country, sparked my imagination and gave me my career. In 1983, my idol, David Bowie, filmed the video for his biggest hit, Let's Dance, in Corinda, New South Wales. I'm sure you're familiar with the story and the video. A small town and a big video. It featured two obscure Aboriginal actors, Terry Roberts and Jolene King, and probably for the first time the world saw indigenous people in an authentic and empathetic way. You know, Bowie loved Australia, and you know that. He was here in 2003. Um, 
But he was also well aware of its dark history and the treatment of its native people. He said in an interview with Rolling Stone magazine, as much as I love this country, it's probably one of the most racially intolerant, well in line with South Africa. The video, of course you know this, but it's worthwhile mentioning, it juxtaposes scenes of hardship faced by two young people of color struggling against the beauty and affluence of white Australia. Without being preachy, it showed indigenous people in a positive and humane light and brought their plight to the attention of the world. When I, let, uh, when I saw Let's Dance on MTV, this was in 1993, and ha I happened to be in Dubai of all places. It demonstrated the power of music to me and took me back to my adolescence. It reminded me that we can transcend our circumstances and also how we can use the power of media to do good. I understood that video as an act of love for the oppressed people of this and other countries, their stolen children and ravaged culture. It was a beautiful and political act of grace to counter the broken promises, the violent crimes, and hate we committed against these minorities. In fact, China Girl, the other video from the Let's Dance album, also shot in Australia, in Sydney and Melbourne, takes on racism even more directly. The Let's Dance video actually influenced me greatly and inspired me to join MTV. I quit my job in Dubai because I saw that video on MTV and I decided that's going to be my career. And more than 25 years later, it also inspired me to make Rebel Music Native America, a film about the indigenous people of the United States, which is my most critically acclaimed work, and I'm very proud of it. So your country actually had a lot to do with a very dramatic turn that my life took when I saw that video. But if you examine global pop culture, you will find an abundance of love, actually. The fact is, it is the dominant subject of more than half of all television and movie content produced worldwide. And yet, most of this content is riddled with cliches, devoid of humanity, and it leaves one hungry for authentic portrayals, for unexamined themes, and empathy for those who are not like us. In fact, one of the great injustices of modern media is its stereotyping of entire cultures especially those who are not like us. And it's human nature to demonize those we do not understand or know much about. In my own career at MTV, and I've been there for 22 years, it's a long time, um, I've tried to reverse this rise of hatefulness by telling the untold story, the stories of the marginalized and the misunderstood. And I have handed the microphone to those whose voices have not been heard in my work, what I've tried to do is expand the definition of love itself, tell untold stories of love, give voice to the voiceless, and tell stories authentically in which we treat, treat the other with humanity. Today, I'd like to, to present some of those stories of love in four different categories, the first one being young love. I can see that everyone in this room is young, so hopefully this will resonate with some of you, with all of you. In 2014 in New York, I spent time with a cross-section of young people, actually, um, people from different countries, races, languages, um, you know, economic status, etc. And, you know, the idea was to really understand their attitudes and feelings on, on many aspects of pop culture and their emotional and romantic lives. And I was surprised. I mean, you would think that in America and the Western world, there would be a plethora of storytelling. And we are obviously being able to satisfy, you know, what most people want to see. But I was surprised. Most of these 18 to 29-year-olds felt that depictions of their relationships in the media were shallow, one-dimensional, and gamified, that love was a game. Um, they felt that portrayals of their relationships were stripped of innocence and beauty and gave examples of shows like The Bachelor. Many also said that media neglected and stereotyped unconventional love, such as gay, bisexual, biracial, or young with old. They also felt that social media had profoundly magnified the power of love to create connections between people in faraway places, a fact that seemed to be lost on storytellers. 
So while visionary shows like Transparent and Orange is the New Black, do you guys watch American television or stream content? Thank you. Please watch more. Um, but, um, you know, shows like Transparent and Orange is the New Black are actually broadening the aperture of love and relationships, but we're still in the dark ages in America and elsewhere as far as authentic and inclusive depictions of love are concerned. Um, so with this insight, we created a multi-platform series called We're Lovers. It featured young people in real relationships around the world, and their stories were told in a cinematic but unfiltered way, portraying the diversity, the heartache, and redemptive power of love, and how it manifests itself in different cities and cultures of the world. You know, the, the way we went about this was we actually cast people in real relationships, whether they were gay or straight or, in some cases, threesomes. And we said, hey, we would like to tell your story authentically and beautifully, and it's, it, we can go about it in a, in a number of ways. You can tell your story the way you want to, or we can shoot it as a reality series. Um, let's decide together. We're bringing the art machinery to the table. You bring your stories. And we made it mandatory that there was one element of fantasy that they had to articulate that we would include in the overall story. We would cut, slice and dice it into the actual, um, into the actual um, episode. And the, result, the results were fascinating. It was an incredibly hard series to make, by the way, because when you're actually tracking real relationships, it's a daily thing. You, know, you break up, you make up, and we have to switch off the cameras and put them on again, and you know, someone's not talking to somebody else. And it's really intimate and crazy and mad to do it. But the end result was actually quite interesting um, because people want their stories told authentically. And we live in an age where we want to share what's happening in our lives with other people, at least the young do. So I'm going to show you first the trailer of the series. And, you know, we, I haven't done a sensitivity test here before I brought some of this content. I just assumed that you won't throw tomatoes and bricks at me. So if uh, you're offended, please, I apologize in advance for anything that you see that you don't like. So the next clip I'm going to show you is about a young bisexual actor in Berlin. We shot two episodes of this in Berlin. It's a very interesting city. Uh, this young actor is promiscuous and he's seeking love, but wrongly assumes he can find it in sexual encounters, all of which are doomed. And his only stable relationship is with an elderly cafe owner who is a friend of his. So see what happens in the final few minutes of this particular episode. So in just still staying with the, the subject of love, um, in 2015, we researched about 100 from, films from around the world um, and came to the conclusion, and these are films, they're contemporary films about love, and we came to the con conclusion that there were many themes not explored and certain types of love simply not portrayed because it was considered unacceptable in that particular culture. We simply don't want older women, for example, to have relationships with younger men. But it's okay for older men to have relationships with younger women, for instance. You'll see very few films that you know, talk about the, the inverse of that. Um, so we reached out to some of the leading international directors to make short films about love they thought should be seen but haven't been made. And we gave these directors free reign to do whatever they wanted as long as we agreed on a script with them and the, the, the film was going to be high quality and meant for a younger audience. Now, it was fascinating because I thought, you know, I made a fancy fift list of 50 names of some of the best directors in the world and foolishly assume that everybody would want to work on Nusrat's dinky little film. <laughs> you know? Um, but the fact is, we were pleasantly surprised as, as to how many people wanted to do those small films for us because they said, this is a great opportunity to actually tell the stories we want to. We want to tell these stories. And there's no pressure... Uh, to do a film about X, Y, or Z. We can actually do the films we want to. And to our utter surprise, we had six of the best directors in the world actually make films for us. Um, the result is called Madly. 
It's an omnibus feature made of six short films from some of the world's most talented directors, including Mia Wasikowska, your very own Mia Wasikowska. Uh, the film has provoked conversations about the transforming nature of love in many cities uh, that has been screened. It's on the festival circuit right now. And first, I'm going to show you the trailer of the film, which was selected to open the international section of the Tribeca Film Festival last year in New York. I encourage you to see this when it comes to your city. Um, the film has actually had tremendous reviews um, and applauded. It's been applauded for expanding the definition of love and celebrating its diversity, but also how the power of love is something we all share. And I want to show you a clip from the Indian film within Madly, which um, for some reason provoked incredible amount of controversy even before it was released. Actually, it still hasn't been released in India, but it has been screened um, at their leading film festival in Mumbai. And um, when I was um, going to actually to the screening, I was advised by a lot of people not to attend because we didn't know how the public or the government, government would actually respond to the film. Now, can you imagine this? I mean, India is a secular country. It has a I mean, thousands of, thousands of years of heritage and culture. And, uh, you know, the Kama Sutra was sort of written in India. We have temples that basically enshrine erotic and romantic love. And here we are in a situation where a filmmaker is actually afraid to show a film because he might be, you know, the theater might be burnt down. The reason for it is that this film depict, depicts a woman as somebody, as a person, a human being that has desire and wants to be loved and want, wants romance. And in India, sadly, it's okay for men to do what they have to do, whether it has to do with sex or romance. But we don't see women, we don't allow women to be sexual creatures. Um, and I find that fact just shocking. Um, the film has been made by uh, one of our premier directors in India, Anurag Kashyap. And it's actress Radhika Apte, a brave, fantastic actress, I think, um, won the Best Actress Award, actually, at Tribeca for the film. And um, I will let you judge, um, you know, what, what you think about this film. But the, the film depicts the taboo subject of an older married woman in a platonic but loving relationship with an 18-year-old boy who lives in her building. And she decides to shave her pubic hair on his advice to please her husband and has to face savage consequences. And this clip is from the film. It's called Clean Shaven. I know it's a little hard to applaud that, um, but it is a brave and bold piece of filmmaking. And I really applaud, actually, the actors uh, especially the actress and the director, to, to bring this film to life. And, you know, to my utter surprise, when I was actually at the screening in, in Mumbai, uh, we had a line around the block for people who, of people who wanted to see the film, and it was un unanimously appreciated and loved, and, uh, and people, you know, they were just kept applauding it because it was so brave that somebody actually made a film like that. Um, But, you know, moving on to, to something a little bit different. When I moved to America more than 20 years ago um, to work for MTV, I actually went into sort of a reverse cultural shock. And I was shocked, actually, to realize how little we, we Americans, knew of the rest of the world. Now, we grew up, I grew up in India, and I thought that most of my contemporaries had a fairly nuanced understanding of what was happening in the rest of the world, in the US, even in Australia, the Western world, Asia. We knew a little bit about the rest of the world. We consumed its music. We listened to, uh, we watched their films. We read the literature. And we kind of knew what was going on. And this isn't from any arrogance. It was just how it was. Um, when I moved to, to New York, actually, which is supposedly the center of the universe, uh, it's a city I love, by the way, so I say this with, um, with amusement, but it, I was actually shocked to, re to find out how little 
anybody in New York knew or cared about the rest of the world. And I had gone there from Dubai. And when I used to talk to people about Dubai, they were like, yes, it's a great big city in India. This is 22 years ago. Uh, but the level of awareness was so, so low that it really, I, I, I was actually very saddened. And more so, even uh, on MTV, you know, we had a lot of great pop music. We took MTV to 150, 155 countries around the world. We took American pop culture to the rest of the world, but we didn't bring anything back. And so there was no music from the rest of the world on MTV in the U.S., and I found that a reason for great despair. Um, and our one-dimensional understanding of other countries was based on politicized news, uh, news headlines and talking heads on television, painting entire cultures in broad strokes, broad, broad and brutal brush strokes, if, if I could add. Uh, for example, Iran is the axis of evil. I mean, Iran is one of the most ancient and rich cultures in history. It's, its government might be doing things that we disagree with, but by no means are the people, all the people in Iran, you know, evil. Um, Afghanistan. I mean, what do you think of when, you, when somebody says Afghanistan? The Taliban, misogyny, the mullahs. Uh, there was a guy called Karzai. You know, American troops are there. They're fighting with people. Bombs are going off, that kind of stuff. Terrible poetry for a culture that is so old. Um, the image of Israel and Palestine is always painted in the poetry of the hatred between those two countries. But in the meantime, we forget that flesh and blood people, like all of us in this room, live in these places. And even though they may not look or speak like us, they live, breathe, and dream and bleed like us. And portraying them as savages who only want to do us harm is actually an, an act of hate in itself. Conversely, seeing the humanity in those who are different from us might be hard, but it is an act of love. And countries in conflict in particular have been stripped of all humanity. Um, we rarely hear from the youth in countries that are in conflict. Um, what are their aspirations and hopes? I mean, Afghanistan is interesting. You know, 65% of the country is under 35 years old. And when we shot an episode of Rebel Music in Afghanistan, all we came across were kids who just wanted to do everyday things, ride a bicycle. Somebody was in a heavy metal band and they wanted to make music. And these everyday concerns are never actually portrayed. And I think it's a great tragedy that we assign these codes to countries uh, painting them all in this one crazy, terrible color. So what are the hopes and aspirations of the young in some of these countries uh, was the question. And my series, Rebel Music, attempts to answer that question. And what we found are incredibly inspiring stories of youth in revolt against oppression and injustice, courageously fighting to liberate their countries um, from you know, the things that we all should be critical of. And if you watch the two seasons of this series, uh, a new and more empathetic understanding will emerge about places uh, like Egypt, Iran, Turkey, Afghanistan, Senegal, and Myanmar, and of course, um, Native America. So the Rebel Music series is highly acclaimed and well-received, and its Native America episode is actually the most viewed, shared, and commented video in MTV's social media history. Now, this is a, an incredible fact, actually, because it doesn't have Kim Kardashian or Kanye West or nudity or celebrity. So why is this so popular? It's popular because it's authentic and it tells a story that needs to be told that is universal. It's not just about America. It's about the struggle of minorities and op the oppressed that is inspiring and all of us need to see and watch these kinds of stories. The series itself has been viewed millions of times and new connections have been sparked. Now these are stories of love also, but a different kind of love. Love of country, love of freedom, love of language, culture, and heritage, and love of music, something that binds all of us. So I'm going to show you the trailer of 
Rebel Music, and it's a, it's a great joy for me because this is one of my favorite projects that I've ever actually worked on, and to be able to share that with you here in Australia is actually quite thrilling. Indigenous peoples, we've been dehumanized so much, and this music is a powerful tool to express our humanity. We are the voices of the voiceless. You are not free from violence anywhere, and that's what I want to change here in Venezuela. I am very proud of this law, and for the women, it was made legal. They give us a fake democracy. It's not real. Corruption, the malversation, the injustice. Senegalese youth was ready, ready for change, ready for revolution. If there is one thing in this world that can make us unite, it's just music. No one's going to come in with the res and save us. We have to decide to be that change that we need. We have to do it ourselves. It gives me a chill every time I see that because I actually visited some of these countries to shoot this and it was incredibly dangerous sometimes. But most of the time, in fact, all of the time, it was so redemptive and so beautiful and so inspiring. I had never in 20 years gone inside a native Indian reservation until I shot Rebel Music. Um, and, you know, the story of that episode is I wanted for two years to tell the story of young Native American musicians. And I kept trying and trying and trying to actually get access to people. But the indigenous community wouldn't let us in because they have been, their stories have been misrepresented and they've been stereotyped for so many decades by mainstream media that they simply would not let us in. And it was very frustrating for me and I grew very sad about this. And then I decided to create an advisory board of only Native American people and said, I beg you, please help me tell your story. And just let me be the machinery through which you tell your own story. And something gave, and they let me in. And we shot the Native America episode with mostly a Native American crew and let the artists actually tell the story about themselves that they wanted to tell rather than the story, rather than the story we wanted to hear. And the result was deeply, deeply gratifying to me and resonated in the country for the first time American audiences actually saw what the native people of their country looked like. They had never seen the young indigenous people of their own country. Um, and it was incredibly, incredibly inspiring for me. And I just want to say that hate is not our natural state. It's for most human beings, hate is a tiring and toxic emotion. It's not sustainable. Our natural state is love. And love is ultimately not about passion. It's about empathy and, and compassion. So in these troubled times, you know, let's focus on creating strategies that foster empathy, something I've tried to do in all my work. And I propose that in our personal and professional lives, let's proactively look for situations where we can step into love with someone as if we're negotiating a deal, as if we're creating art together. Let us create love-based solutions to hate-based problems. We can do, all of us can do our bit by becoming more tolerant of those different from us and take the sometimes difficult path of listening to their story even if we don't agree with it. We must listen. 
None of the work you saw today would have been possible without that approach. Like any collaboration, this is going to be hard because we are thinking not just, a, uh, not just about our own needs, but what we have to offer the other. Creating bridges of understanding between sometimes opposing ideologies is not easy. It's very hard, actually, but it's entirely possible. So to reinvent myself in America, you know, when I, went, when I moved to the States, I was a sensitive and shy person who was used to a very Japanese style of management. Um, but I realized that the culture in America was so gregarious and so assertive that I had to become someone else. Um, you know, I had to change my personality. It was hard, but I succeeded, and I developed a second persona, one that was able to negotiate a harsh and competitive world, and I forced myself to change. And if I could, have, if I could make that change, I think all of us can also develop an avatar of love, a, merc a mercenary of love who, wherever possible, steps into love with someone to create an artwork of empathy. And in closing, I'd like to say that in this time of hate, we all have the power to actually change the world. You know, a lot of us sometimes think, hey, what can I do? I'm just an individual, tiny person living my tiny life. And I think that's simply not true because we can do a lot of, lot of things uh, starting with very small steps. Um, I think we can all become diplomats of love who track down the other. You know, there are lots of others in this world that we have to understand and build brid bridges with. Um, and we can, we can create an artwork of love with them. Um, we can reverse this tide of hatred, I believe, by being more empathetic and seeing the humanity in others. We can change the world by being more tolerant of those different from us. And we can all use the power of love that we have within us to heal the world. So thank you for listening to me today. Thank you, Nusra. Now, I'm sure there are some people in the room who have questions. Would anyone like to ask? Question? Yes, PJ. We'll just get a microphone. Thank you. So were you studying film when you saw the David Bowie? No, uh, I wasn't. I grew up, up in David, on David Bowie in Lucknow, India. Um, you know, people cannot imagine 8,000 or 10,000 miles away from here. A little kid in a dinky town in India has actually got every single record Bowie ever put out. <laughs> and is hallucinating an entirely new future for himself than the one that his parents wanted him to have, which is to be a fucking doctor. <laughs> Every, everybody in my family is a doctor. Um, so I wasn't studying film. I was working for Honda, the car company in Dubai, uh, when I one day switched on my gigantic HDTV set, because in Dubai we all love electronics and gold. And, <laughs> You know, I switched on the t television, and for the first time, I saw MTV. And the video on MTV was Let's Dance. And from that point on, I got a virus. And it was the virus of music, the virus of MTV. And I decided to quit my job and fly to New York and knock on MTV's door to give me a job. And guess what? They didn't. <laughs> They didn't give me a job. I had to try like 50,000 times. And then they did. So I learned how to make films when I joined the company. Question here? Um, yeah, Nusrat, my daughter's been working in refugee camps in um, uh, Greece and um, Iranian and Afghan refugees. And I didn't even realize MTV had this sort of, or well, the music and... Uh, the thought of, you know, there are a lot of single guys there that, that at the minute in terrible despair and whatever. So have you had any um, inroads into that? Or, um, you know, it's certainly something that I'll send to my daughter and say, um, you know, they have a lot of programs for kids and schools and stuff, but as far as music <coughs> being able to help, that sounds like a wonderful thing that I think I'll, you know, certainly make her aware of. And I don't know if they're... You know, whether they have access to the internet and things, but whether they actually, you know, use it and have it, but they certainly need the therapy. <laughs> well, 
Well, thank you for asking that question. It's a very important question. And, you know, about 18 months ago, I decided to take a sabbatical after working for 22 years in one company. Um, and one of the first things I did was actually um, go to Lebanon to volunteer in a Syrian refugee camp about six or seven miles from the Syrian border. And what I found there, you know, like all of us in this room, we had, I had this, this stream of news coming at me about Syrian refugees. You know, every country, every big country in the world has a filter or a point of view on Syrian refugees. For example, America thinks that they're terrorists and we should not let a single one of those guys enter the country because they might take our jobs and blow us all up. Uh, which is a shame for the leader of the free world to have that attitude. Germany, on the other hand, has been more magnanimous, <coughs> as has been Canada and other countries. But there are other countries which uh, shoot any refugees that try to enter the border. Having said all that, I had heard all of this stuff, and I decided to investigate myself. I wanted to touch the situation. And I went as a civilian, not as some big-shot media executive, to this camp in Becca in Lebanon. And what I found, I think, you know, my time there within the refugee camps is the most profoundly moving experience of my entire life because the expectation that had been created was everyone would be hungry and injured and angry and people will come running at us and try to steal our food and our money and stuff like that. And what I found, to my utter surprise, was the most gracious people on the planet who had seen their children blown up by bullets. Their people, young kids who seen their grandparents and parents killed under, crushed under tanks. And these people are living with next to nothing in the wilderness. And they had smiles on their face and all they ever wanted to do, most of the... I, I, can, I can tell you my experience. I must have interacted with about 200 of, 250 to 300 people on a regular basis, the camps that I was visiting. Not a single person in those camps wants to come to America or to Canada or to Germany. All they want to do is go back home. Who wants to come anywhere else if they could go back home? Nobody wants to kill us or hurt us. They want to watch football and send their kids to school. Um, and I think it, it, it was deeply, deeply humbling for me to have that experience. But your question was about something else. And I think what you're doing is ident identifying a problem, I think, that if we were to program the Syrian refugee crisis differently and give these folks the means that they actually need to have, we might have a very different situation in the world. Thank you for asking. It's a very important thing. There's some more questions over this side, maybe? Yep. Thanks for a great talk. Um, it, I think, you know, especially the, the earlier movies, films you show, were very much about sex and love and conflating, you know, sex and love together. And, um, and I was really interested to hear what you said about having to have an avatar of love and that putting on, you know, a, a mask that is your, is your love self, perhaps. And so I'm just wondering if you could talk about, you know, what is an authentic love? You know, we're, we're in an era where sex and love are very closely associated. And I guess in how in your work are you sort of promoting a much more authentic connection and empathetic love? that is meaningful and changeful, I guess? You know, I don't think that my work is about trying to create authentic love. My, I'm a storyteller, uh, and I consider my job to be to tell somebody's story authentically rather than try to prescribe how they should be. And the truth of it is that we like to always, first of all, tell stories that we're comfortable with. For example, in America, until recently, you never saw two men, two boys kissing or, or having a relationship on screen until very recently. This has changed just in the past five years. What does that mean? Why aren't we showing that? I mean, is, that, is it that there's only heterosexual romance in, in, the, in the world? Um, 
And any time gay love or sex was, or, or attraction was portrayed in America, I mean, I'm using broad generalizations, but you know, work with me on this. But most of the time, those relationships were always shown as specialty things, you know, things that were happening you know, in, within the sort of realm of pornography. And, and if there was a gay love story, it always ended badly. I mean, what is that film about the two cowboys? Beautiful film, but why did those guys have to always, be, you know, separate? Can there not be a happy ending in that? My point, I think what you're asking me is about authenticity. My point is whether it's romantic or gay or sexual or sex or, or, or love of country or the stories of people in other countries that we just sort of vilify because they're not like us. It's about trying to present a balanced, multidimensional view of the other. And the other are people who are not like us. We tend as human beings to gravitate to things that we're familiar with. And I think, and, and the things that we're comfortable with. We're comfortable with seeing straight love stories. So that's cool. But every, anytime we see something that's different, we're uncomfortable and we shut ourselves off and we, treat, we start treating those people as the other. And that's the reason why North Korea is the other. Maybe it's run by a bunch of crazies, but I can guarantee you that every single person in North Korea is not evil. It's common sense. Every single person in Iran is not evil. Every single person in Syria is certainly not evil. So the point about authenticity that I keep talking about is to present stories about people and cultures authentically so that evil is balanced with good, you know? The crazies in a country are balanced with the good people in that country. We never see that on television or, on, in fact, in most films. Did I answer your question? Maybe we'll go up there. Thanks, Renee. Yep. Um, I want to ask a question on whether you can, uh, whether you've thought of applying your approach and your techniques to those uh, uh, people who hate in our societies. I mean, you've got a lovely, wonderful theme and you've got a good objective with it. But there are plenty of people in our Western society who are hate hating mainstream society uh, in your own country, in America, You've got a lot of white supremacists. I think a lot of those are middle-aged and old people, but they may also be young people. Sure. In Europe, in Britain, in Germany, you've got lots of young now Nazis full of tattoos and, and so on and shaved heads who are hating a lot of society. They're not in, they're not in the, the other parts of the world, the other countries you have mentioned. I wonder if you ever thought of um, approaching those type of people and trying to gauge their authentic... Or, or to gauge authentically the reasons that they have adopted in hating mainstream society? Um, again, that's a, a wonderful question if I understand that correctly. I think my humble opinion, and I by no means am I an expert uh, anthropologist or social scientist or anything, historian even. I'm just a humble storyteller, but um, one of the reasons why I think Trump came to power is because we did not understand the other side, um, the side that voted for him. And this side, in my opinion, lives in the states which are deemed middle America. These are coal miners and people with blue collar jobs who are also just like us. And we did not properly hear their stories, their concerns, and present those stories and their concerns on the national and the national stage. As a result of, of that, the person who posed as if they were listening to that, to their concerns and addressing those concerns, came to power. And I think it's an example of the, trying to at least empathize and listen to the other side. Now, that other side also includes white supremacists, white, the white supremacy groups that you're talking about. Um, and, you know, I think one could debate whether or not white supremacists should, should get equal, equal, you know, airplay or airtime or whatever it is 
relative to other more peace-loving groups. I mean, that's a debatable issue, but we do live in a free society, and I think everybody has a right to opine and talk and tell their stories. The question is, do we have the common sense to actually create policies that help and encourage hate groups? You know? But to your point, I think it is important to listen. It is important to listen. If someone's acting within the rule of law, I think absolutely it's important to listen because listening is, there's nothing long, wrong with listening. At least we understand where someone's coming from. Did I? We have another, some more questions, I know. Yes, the gentleman over here. Does the words of and music of Bob Dylan influence you in any way? The music of Bob Dylan. Yeah. Does anybody know Bob Dylan? <laughs> um, profoundly. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, Dylan along with Bowie and Joan Baez and you know, I know that I'm outing myself as someone quite old, uh, but, but actually I'm not because I joined MTV when I was two years old. No, just kidding. <laughs> Absolutely, I mean I think Dylan's music and his, um, his, his mythology and his um, catalog has had a deep and profound effect on me and I still follow Dylan. I think he's one of the greatest living singers and artists out there and I'm actually watching him for the 550th time in November in Beacon Theatre in New York City. So if you guys are coming, trucking through New York, please come. Um, and he's performing from the 20th to the 25th. Okay, question down the front here. Nusrat, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight and to hear your passion and the way you've expressed it, particularly the, the one about the young Native Americans given a free reign to express what they thought was important and you capturing that in your film. What I'm interested in particularly to hear is what you think about the lack of places where people can come together to talk about things that matter. On the premise from a facilitation process, Whoever comes are the right people. And whenever we, we respect each other, something good happens. Can you see that as a, a function of your kind of filmmaking? Um, you know, again, thank you so much for asking. And I think we have to give the, the, you know, the Bob Hawk Center some credit and appreciation for what they're doing. Look at this dialogue. Think about this. I mean, if not for Jacinta and the programming that she's putting together, it would not have happened. And I think we actually, you know... I was, uh, I was walking through the, their beautiful art gallery, which I hope we will have a drink in. Um, and, you know, the, the depth and breadth of the type of programming they're putting together is actually quite moving. And, you know, it, it pleases me to be, um, to be with audiences like this, smaller settings instead of these big razzle-dazzle settings where we're talking about the future of this and the future of that. This is more important. Going back to your question... You know, we have the power to do this ourselves. We don't actually have to. This is the age of disruption. We don't need big institutions to support and enable the things we want to do. We can all do. I mean, if you all can just give yourselves each other's emails, you can form a Facebook or whatever group yourselves and start a small revolution. You know? Make shit up. <laughs> do things. That's what I did. You know, when I joined MTV, and not that I'm some big sort of like change agent or something, but when I joined the company, I was telling you, I was so dismayed to see we didn't have any understanding, not only of the issues of other countries, but their music. Music was our domain. Music was our constituency. And I thought that it was a, a, a business opportunity and the right thing to do to celebrate the music of other countries particularly countries we wanted to do business with and establish relationships with. So I went and fought for us to start a new division called MTV World, which would do the inverse of what we had been doing with MTV all along, which is beaming our music and our culture into other, target bombing countries and with our culture, and never bringing anything back. And we, with MTV World, started to do that, bring the music of other countries into the U.S. And not just countries like Africa and India and, and uh, Korea, but also Norwegian heavy metal. How great is that? You're nodding, because I know you love it. <laughs> uh, you know, so I think we're all change agents. I mean, I think that we live 
in a very empowered world where we can use all of the tools that are now at our disposal that we didn't have 15 to 20 years ago. We can all start a change. We can all start a revolution, actually. Excellent. Okay, we've got time for one more question. I'm sorry. Maybe this gentleman, gentleman who is looking very handsome. I know, handsome. he's been very patient, so... Well, I like your jacket too. Um, so, um, looking at our title, like Love in the Era of Hate, and it sort of implies, and I think you hear a lot in the media, of like, oh, we've never lived in more violent times, things have never been worse. But there was actually a uh, Harvard professor, I think his name is Pinkler, who sort of sliced and diced the numbers, and he said, actually, no matter when you start and when you stop, human civilization is always getting better and better. We're getting kinder to each other, we're being less bloody, we're less deadly to each other. So, I was thinking, maybe you could think about framing the conversation and also doing something to say, hey, spruik us up. We're not actually getting worse and worse. Actually, society is getting better and better and celebrate our kindness and people like you and many others bridging us and actually making our civilizations better because we're actually getting better, not worse over time. I agree with you. Um, I actually agree with you. I think that I'm actually reading a book called um, Homo Deus, you know, and it talks about how in the past three or four decades, you know, humanity has made so many strides. We've eliminated diseases that were killing thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. We've conquered big challenges. We've sent, you know, ships, spaceships, spaceships to, you know, um, faraway planets. We've done all kinds of great stuff. That's, that's right. But my sliver, my, my lens is a very specific media lens. And I th happen to think, because you're asking me, um, that just in the same way that there are still so many inequities in this world, I mean, you cannot deny that although we've come a long way, there are still people going hungry every single night when in the Western world, in America, you know, we throw tons of food out every single day. It goes waste because we're the worst, world's most consumptive society but other people are going hungry. So there's inequity in terms of food. There's inequity in the distribution of wealth. There's inequity in the distribution of health care. All those things have not actually been fixed. I believe, through my very specific lens, there's also a great inequity in the distribution and access to media. And 90%, I don't know what the exact percentage is, of the media in this world, and media is very important, is owned by a very small fraction of this world. And there is terrible injustice and inequity in this because billions of people, millions of people, cannot tell their stories or get their stories heard. And that's a terrible, terrible inequity. Syrian refugees, 11 million people. Just to give a terrible example, because I, I know where you're coming from, there's a lot to be happy and optimistic about also. We should celebrate that. 11 million people. Everybody has a point of view on Syrian refugees, but not a single person I know in my social circle in America has actually met a Syrian refugee or heard from their mouths, what do they want? What's their story? How terrible is that? We have, we're passing judgment on an entire generation of Syrian people without ever having heard from them what their fucking story is. How terrible is that? But that's a negative example. There are also great examples that are positive of people who have over overcome challenges, people who are living an amazing life in different countries, a life that's different from ours, but so it's good, it's celebratory. We haven't even heard their stories. All we have heard on a daily basis on prime time, and I can give you the American example, not the Australian example, because I don't watch Australian TV, I want to. Um, is the same trope over and over again. And it's boring. And, and I think it's unfair. Um, so that's my little lens into this. But you're right. I think our concerns now for the next 50 years are not even how do we eradicate malaria or smallpox. It's about how to become divine, how to live forever. But guess what? There are billions of people who actually don't know where they're going to sleep tonight or where the next meal is going to come from. Yes, so maybe, okay. Oops. We'll, <laughs> let's you have, can shut this off anytime by pulling the cord. Maybe the lovely, lovely gentleman sitting there will have the last question from you. Yeah. Oh, we'll just wait for the microphone. Thank you. 
It's a very special occasion for me here in Australia, and I feel very proud that one of my city uh, dwellers has come here, and I am listening to him in such an exalted state of uh, things. But uh, and I am really proud of him that he has developed that sensitive heart at the in the Lucknow from the city from which I also belong. Oh, you do. I have, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, I have come from there, and I must say to you. But my question is, it's very easy to uh, bipolarize mm. love and hate. But have you ever explored in your studies love, then lust, and hate? Love and lust and hate? Yeah. In my personal, st I mean, one I of the... I mean to say, all stories that you are making yeah. and you are presenting. Mm. But if you see only in bipolar perspective, then right. things may go wrong somewhere, I feel. If you see love, then lust, then hate, or hate, then lust, then love. In your presentations that I have seen, mm. it is more a lust than any love. Okay. And certainly it's bipolar. Isn't uh, it? <laughs> I understand your point, sir. Um, I think that my stories are not about um, just love or lust. Um, I think that the continuum of, and by the way, I am not an expert at love. I can just tell you this right now, <laughs> although I don't want to position myself as somebody who knows a great deal about love. I'm completely artless, and um, I'm a technician. But I would argue that on the continuum um, that you might have, there is, of love, there is love on the one extreme, let's say the left, and on the right extreme there's hate. And lust is a different thing. Lust is chemicals, you know, lust is about chemistry. So love can survive, for example, in a marriage which has no lust anymore. So I think that there are nuances, and I don't think that I'm by any means trying to um, be bipolar and say, hey, you can either love, which also includes the side benefit of lust, and you can hate. I don't think that it, that's what we're saying here. But I understand the, the thought, and we can talk some more about it over a glass of wine. <laughs> or better still, some Russian vodka. <laughs> okay, I think we'll end there, and there's a lot of love in the room tonight, Ms. Rat. Thank you. And, um, and I'm feeling it, and I'm sure you're feeling it as well. So please, thank you so much for making that long journey to join us. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you at another Hawk Centre. We've still got loads more coming up in November and December, so I look forward to seeing you at another event very soon. Thank you and good night.